Okay, we're on the air. Can you hear me good, everyone? How's the sound? Someone give me a thumbs up. I see there's some questions there already, but I'm going to look down at the bottom now just to make sure uh, you can hear me all good. Hope you're having a good day. Thanks for tuning in. Sound is good. Perfect. So it looks like there's, uh, oh, there's about 100 people here. More than that now. I appreciate it, guys, folks, everyone, for stopping by here now. I'm going to spend a bit of time, answer as many questions as I can. Let's try to, uh, I know the episode six there only came out a couple days ago. So let's keep the spoilers down. We don't want to ruin it for no one. So any questions you got about the end of that uh, that series, maybe try and uh, keep them for a later date. I got Heather alongside me here. She's going to help me out with some questions in case I fall behind. But I'll try to keep it short and sweet. Sound is good, so they say. Uh, let's get going. Sack's in the house as well. Sack. What do you have? Oh no, he's coming over now. Right on. Hey buddy, say hi, Sack. Hey, look, look at this. Look up here. Yeah, there you go. There you go. Okay. Over to your bed now. Go lie down. Good boy. He listens sometimes. <laughs> All right. So we're going to take it away at the top here now. Now the first question, someone's over in Ireland. He's asleep now. That's it. If uh, whoever misses it, we'll be able to, this will be up on the channel so you can watch it later. If there's a question you missed and you want to go back and see what my answer was, you'll be able to check back in. Uh, first question is from Bastien. Bastien, uh, why choice of tent, MSR, okay, but would you, why, uh, would you not consider a stronger one? I just started using the MSR tents a few years ago. Well, more than a few years ago now. Oh, back in 2015. And the first one I had was a mother hubba, uh, the three person tent. Still got that one. But then uh, once I started trying to lighten my load a little bit, I went to the hubba hubba two person tent. And it's a good tent. Uh, there was some, uh, <clears throat> had some issues with it there going uh, down the stretch on that last trip that I just aired. But uh, that could have been a bad apple. I, I don't know. But I still, uh, I got another one now sent to me, the same same tent, hubba hubba. And it's just a good quality tent. It's, it's, it's real light, somewhere around three pounds. And it's trusted. I mean, I've spent a, a, around certainly close to 300 nights now in that tent. And other than a few issues I had in the last trip, it's been, uh, it's been bomb proof. So there's other brands. But, you know, that's like gear. There's there's lots of things you can get. There's lots of different choices you can make. And you can dwell on that for a long time. And maybe I'll switch up uh, to a different tent down the road. But for now, I'm sticking with that. And uh, the more important thing is just getting out there with whatever gear you got. So the next question uh, I got. Josh, like John Funk. What's that? There's a paper. Oh, I don't step that's down to the bottom, or uh, someone just paid for a question there. So it says, what does Saku mean? How did you name him? And how do you stay fit between adventures? Saku, Saku, I don't really know the meaning. I've, some people have have sent me what Saku means in other languages. Uh, I think one was Arrowhead, was it Heather? Harpoonhead. Yeah. Harpoonhead, sorry, Harpoonhead. Uh, someone sent me one the other day and said Saku means pockets. In their language so but the reason why i named him saku because i'm a big montreal canadian fan go habs go for any other fans out there of course they're in the stanley cup finals starting tomorrow night that's great but uh, I, I was saku koivu was my favorite player growing up he was the captain of the canadians uh one of the longest serving captains in canadians history so uh i went with saku i thought it was a cool name and so it is how did you name him? Well, I answered that one. And how do you stay fit between adventures? Uh, I've been an athlete my entire life. I always like to keep in good shape, you know, uh, so I'm 
just just keep moving keep moving uh you know try to exercise on a daily basis uh, do a bit of running lift some weights canoeing around uh, just hiking with some weight in my pack like i do with the dogs as well uh we'll go off and i'll put some you know a bit of weight in my in my backpack maybe i put a bag of dog food in there a full bag of dog food and some other little items and i put some dog food in the in beer and sack who's pack and we go on a hike for an hour or so uh sometime throughout the day but just try to keep moving and i think regardless if i was doing these trips or not I, I'm, I'm an active person and that's just the lifestyle i live so i always keep moving i think there's another one yeah. someone boosted up there have you ever thought about doing a Gander River trip? Northwest Gander, Gander Bay would be an amazing trip. Yeah, Gander River would be a great trip. Uh, you know, there's, I've done a lot of a lot of spots. I've camped in Newfoundland, and there's a lot more I want to camp. Uh, the Gander R River would be an excellent trip. It's one of the bigger rivers here in Newfoundland. You can get into good, some good salmon fishing as well. Uh, so one day for sure I will get in there, but. Spent a lot of time in Newfoundland and been up to Labrador a bit now. And I'd like to spread my wings and, and move out to Quebec and maybe even Western Canada, uh, Alaska. These are big dreams of mine. So trips could go anywhere, but certainly like to, uh, to do some more local ones over my lifetime in Gander River. I can't see why I won't float down that, that river. Heather, is there another one there? Um, you got a shout out from Co-Create Happy. Thank you, Justin and Seku, for such amazing adventures and absolutely beautiful scenery. Oh, thank you. Appreciate that. And great question so far, guys. Uh, we're going to move on, I think, the next one now after the, the first one up top. A Dan Francis Project has one. I was wondering, how does the dog who didn't go on the long trips act when you were home? Is there anger? We're happy to see you. So I guess you're referring to beer. And Saku was in that position as well. This past winter, myself and beer went up in the Labrador for a full month. Cold temperatures, you know, minus 30 degrees Celsius and colder. Not uh, an excellent climate for Saku. It's very hard. Uh, I'm setting up the canvas tent, for example. It takes me a couple hours and it's cooked. It's hard for Saku to be lying in a snowbank, but with beer, the husky, she can lay down and all is good. But to that end, uh, coming back, either one of them, of course, usually it's been beer in that situation at home. And when me and Saku have came back from, from some pretty long trips, you know, 83 days, 63 days, 52 days. And she just, she's more or less excited to see us. There's no anger or jealousy or anything like that. She just gets fired up and runs around the backyard and her and Saku uh, greet each other and we're good to go. Okay, Dan has another one. Uh, in, in case of Saku, is there any uh, separation anxiety? Once you're home, you spend a lot of time together on these trips and never apart. Do you got to take him everywhere you go now? Uh, no, not at all. Actually, we, you know, we often, me and Heather may take off. A few weeks ago, we went and paddled in the rafts. Uh, Heather has a raft now as well. I made a post on my Facebook and Instagram. Some of you guys may have seen that, but uh, we went out for a couple trips, uh, gone all day, and, and they're fine as kind. Uh, we come home, I mean, there's nothing tore up. Uh, they're pretty relaxed about it. We just make sure we get them out for an exercise before we go out ourselves. That usually helps. We have one from the Newfie Woodsman. Hey, Justin, don't know if you remember, but when you had a meet in Grand Falls, Windsor, we were there from Gander, Brady and Cameron. Just wanted to know how the blueberry tea was. Brady and Cameron, I remember you guys. Yeah, 100%. Blueberry tea was excellent. I uh, really enjoyed that. And I've been I'm wanting to get a little bit more. I actually still have a little tiny bit downstairs. I had tucked it aside and forgot about it. So uh, I'm going out on a trip now in a couple of weeks. So I think I'm going to take it with me and finish it off. But that stuff was great. I had little tea bags, of course. I take along and put the tea in. And uh, I really appreciate it. And every time I had a sip, I was thinking about you boys. So thanks again. And uh, appreciate you coming out to the top there. I did that time and hope you're well. Hope you're getting out yourselves. We have a shout out from Outdoor Enthusiastic. Uh, BC would make for a good expedition. I'm from Vancouver Island. Great spot for adventures. Yeah, yeah. Love to go to BC, of course. Uh, another great spot, Western Canada. That will be excellent to get out there and, uh, you know, go around and big mountain ranges. Uh, uh, great country. So certainly like to get out there down the road. 
And DM gave you a shout out saying really enjoyed watching your latest trip. Keep up the great work. Yeah, thanks. I appreciate that. Uh, thanks, guys, for the for the support there. And Heather's doing a great job of reading out questions for me. So that's a big help. So I'll go back up to the to the top, Heather. I, I will now. And yeah. we have Jim Hurley. Do you have any stickers? I'd love to purchase some for my canoe. Cheers to you both on your upcoming adventures. Uh, no, Jim, I, I did have stickers, and I was giving them out uh, with my with my book, of course, Man and Dog Through the Newfoundland Wilderness and, and Saku's Great Newfoundland Adventure. Both those books, when I was uh, – I don't have any on me now at, at my house, but w when I was shipping them out, when the book came out uh, a little while back, I was give, giving stickers to people that way. And uh, I had a couple of markets where I was selling the books here locally in Newfoundland, and I would go out with some hats – and some stickers there with a little logo I had put on them. Uh, but once I sold them all, I didn't get any more. So hopefully down the road I will. Merchandise is something I haven't dipped too much into. Uh, just more focused on, uh, you know, editing the videos and any of the writing. And, of course, most importantly, getting out in the woods and and uh, seeing as much as I can and doing what I love to do. So, again, I appreciate you wanting to do that. And stay tuned for sure. Uh, next one, you got that for me? Uh, Nick, yeah. Nick, okay, someone asked, boosted one? Yeah, I have a Donovan beard. <laughs> hey, Justin, I watched all of your videos and noticed you love having a bear on your adventures. What's your favorite Newfoundland bear? My favorite Newfoundland bear, uh, for a while it was India, India beer, and I think it's probably still is my favorite uh, local local bottle of beer, you know, but uh, since the craft beers have came out and got on the scene, uh, you know, all these different stouts and IPAs and, and sour beers and stuff, uh, I'm, I'm a really big fan of uh, the Calm Tom from Kitty Vitty Brewery in uh, in St. John's, so shout out to Kitty Vitty there, uh, but yeah, so that would probably be my favorite, favorite craft beer would be the Calm Tom, it's a double IPA, and an India beer is a local local brew so yeah a couple questions about your teeth sometimes it's there sometimes it's not what's the deal oh yeah yeah sometimes the teeth are there and sometimes they aren't maybe we should be uh, they can probably hear but sometimes i may be answering the question and i don't know if people know what it is so sometimes your tooth is there sometimes it's not can you tell us what happened to your tooth yeah just keeping you guessing with the tooth you know uh, sometimes I, I flip it in there and sometimes I throw it in the pack and forget about it. And as the trip wears on, I usually forget about it uh, more than I should. But the dentist tells me to keep it in as as much as I can uh, to keep teeth from shifting around and stuff. So I, I try my best, but uh, that's it. Like when on the Labrador trip uh, across Labrador, I lost my denture on uh, about – the, the seven or eight days into the trip and you may have noticed early in that series i had it in you know in the first episode crossing labrador the 83 day trip i uh, had it in and then all of a sudden i didn't have it in for the rest of the uh the trip 76 77 days because i was sitting down eating lunch and laid my tooth uh took it out laid it on my mat bag there on the side of me and then ate my food and then when i got up i must have picked the mat bag up and went on and the tooth went somewhere on the side of the red wine river and it's probably still there floating, or I don't know, maybe it got washed out into the ocean. Who knows? But uh, it was lost. I think they want to know how it was lost, did they? Yeah. Yeah, some people. From Larry L. I have oh, I didn't a oh, sorry. question. Yeah. <laughs> a lot of people probably know this, but uh, one time I came home and Heather wasn't too happy. So there you go. I lost my tooth. <laughs> No, uh, it was a hockey stick. Uh, I played some junior hockey uh, in uh, Miramichi, New Brunswick for four years back when I was uh, I'm 33 now. So f from the age of 17 to 21, I, I played in Miramichi, New Brunswick. And my last year there, I just got a stick in the mouth and lost uh, in practice nonetheless and lost a couple of teeth. So that's the way it is. Next one. So some people are uh, – I guess it's there's an option there to a super chat option. I don't really know much about it, but you can boost your question up by paying a few dollars. So no pressure to do that, and I'll get around to the, the rest of the questions the best I can, but I'm going to answer these ones first. 
Yep. So we have a question about your wool pants. Uh, were I have a question about your wool pants from everything considering were they worth the money from Larry L. The wool pants. Uh, I, I've, I don't really know what wool pants Larry is referring to. Uh, maybe the wool pants I wore on the winter trip. Uh, I don't really know. Yeah, maybe I, I, I wear uh, smart wool long johns, I suppose, uh, on the winter trips and summer trips. I even take them for, for sleeping. And I think he might be talking about ones I've used in the winter, which are made by Big Bill, uh, a company there in Quebec. And uh, I have a couple pairs of those. I have a, the, I think they're 80% wool or they're green ones. And then I, this winter, myself and Heather picked up as well, a pair uh, as well, the plaid 100% wool. And uh, very great pants. I wore them up in Labrador and, you know, minus 30, minus 40 temperatures this past winter. And they were excellent. So, uh, again, no endorsement here, but I recommend those pants uh, made by Big Bill. Uh, a very good price and, and quality product for sure. So can everyone hear, uh, let's, I'm going to go right down to the bottom and just give me a yes if you can hear Heather when she reads out the questions. So can you hear Heather when she reads out the questions on the side of me there, guys? Good. Perfect. All right. Excellent. We got one yes there, it looks like. <laughs> About 45. Excellent, guys. I should have figured that out. Okay, what's the next one that got boosted up there, Heather? We don't want to miss those ones. Nope. Um, we got another one here. Hi, Justin. What kind of boots and socks do you use? Are your shoes or boots comfortable to kneel in the canoe? Do you get blisters after a day with wet feet? And that's from Sarah Liss. Oh, I can see those here now. It feels like some of the early questions have disappeared, have they not? Yeah. Oh, why is that happening? I don't know. Lots of questions. I'm sorry, I may have missed some of the questions. So, try, if you if your question disappeared and you didn't boost it up, uh, you can ask it again. I'm sorry about that. So, I, I can see Sarah's here. What kind of boots and socks do you use for your recent 52 day canoe trip? Uh, I wore the Loa the Loa boots. Uh, I've wore the Combat boots before, but they uh, I also tried out a pair because they do support me. Loa supports me uh, because we we have a good relationship there that's a brand i believe in and i'm only going to stick with people who the gear is good and it's good quality gear and i don't want to deal with anyone else uh, if it's not something i'm pleased with but for for the lower boots they're great and i've tried the combat uh style boot they have it's in their uh, uh, perf uh, uh i think it's performance category or, or professional category sorry but if, from this particular trip i had used the tibet highs so they're tibet model basically the professional line uh tibet and they're the highest boot they have they're very high uh for me i always kind of uh, compare it to when i played hockey and wearing a hockey skate you have that it goes pretty high up on your ankle and stiff and you get that good support and it's for for hiking boots you know especially when i'm on a lot of uneven surfaces and and rough terrain and going up the rivers I want to have that high ankle support and it's important too on the portages with heavy packs to have good ankle support. Uh, if you're doing lighter trips with smaller bags, you'll get by with a, with a lower cut boot or, or sneaker, hiking sneaker. But uh, for me, it's, I like something high and the socks. I just wear, uh, normally just wear a thin pair of wool socks. Uh, if the temperatures are colder, maybe I wear a thin pair with a, with a second pair of medium wool socks uh, that prevents any chafe. I find sometimes with just the single thin sock, I get a little bit of chafe. Haven't had knock on wood too much trouble with blisters in all my going, but uh, I do think wearing a second medium sock that has, uh, which is also wool, helps out. So that's kind of what I had this summer: two pairs of thin and a medium thickness. Uh, and the boots are comfortable uh, kneeling in the canoe. I don't find no issues whatsoever. <laughs> Sometimes in the canoe, I actually take them off and just wear like my little water shoes I take with me. And sometimes even socks. Do I get blisters after a whole day with soaking feet? I guess I kind of answered that there a second ago, but 
I've gotten a couple, but very, very few. I don't know. I've spent a lot of my lifetime in work boots, even before I got into this stuff. Uh, I was out landscaping and whatnot. So I always wore like, you know, kind of heavy work boots. And I guess I maybe have my heart and my feet. Zach is over here now being a bit of silk looking for some attention. Hey, Zach. Um, we got two Zach, hold on your bed here now. Come on. Up here on your bed. Everyone wants to see you anyways, but come over here. Up on your bed. You might be well outside, did you hear that? Yeah. Close to supper time, I'd say. Uh, have something to do with it. Anyways, that's all good. Do you, uh, do you know dog first aid? How prepared are you for an emergency with Saku? I just want to finish that question. Oh. Uh, with, with the soaking feet, I do take my boots off halfway through the day as well and let my feet dry out a little bit. Uh, but still putting them back in the wet boots. So some people are more prone to blisters and others. I guess it's just a different story. Go ahead, Heather. Uh, do you know dog first aid? How prepared are you for an emergency with Saku? And can you make a map reading how to video? So two questions in one, I guess. The first one is, yeah, I mean, I, I go talk to vets before I leave on these long trips. I've talked to veterinarians a number of times and they've gave me some good advice. And of course they've gave me some good first aid equipment and no, I'm, I'm not a vet, but I have the materials with me to, to do the minor, the minor things. I mean, I can, I can sew so, and I take suture kits for both of us. If, if it came down to, there was a bad cut, again, knock on wood, my favorite thing to do. If that ever happened, uh, I can sew. So I guess I can stitch as well. And, you know, you never know until you get yourself in the situation and then you'll learn it then. Learn by doing. That's how I kind of try to live my life. Uh, you can't have all the answers. And what was the end of that question? Um, can you make a map reading how-to video? A map reading how-to video, that would be a great idea. I'll certainly jot that down and, and consider it down the road. Um, next one is, how many caribou did you see on that last trip? And second question, where is the new scar from? Okay, so there are these paid. Yep. Okay, so the first one. How many caribou did you see on that last trip? How many caribou on the last trip in the Beta Nord? 52 days. We've seen, I think it was about 110 caribou. So uh, it's a good sign. They were, we were kind of seeing them every other day. And uh, that was great. That's what I go out there for, is to see that wildlife and have those close encounters. And, of course, in, in that area of the Beta Nord, I mean, they're seeing very few humans. So it was nice to see, see them in that setting, nice and relaxed and you can get really close to caribou. They're not like uh, typically a moose are more timid and you, you see a moose and if they see you, they're gone in a split second. But caribou, sometimes you can, you can get pretty close and, and not, uh, you know, you're not really harassing them at all. They're, uh, they're pretty gentle about it. And so that way it's also good to get good footage and, and relax and, and enjoy the uh, ex experience intimately. Okay. Next one. Um, and the second part of their question was, where it's, where's the new scar from? Oh, the new scar. Uh, so that question had been asked a lot there throughout the series on the comments. Basically, I'm sh a lot of people, especially Newfoundland, probably know about this. I was uh, The reason why I went in the, the Beta Nord on this 52-day trip is because I was actually off to Labrador uh, at the same time last summer. And I was going to fly into the headwaters of the Red Wine and do a, a trip down the Beaver River, which was uh, actually the Hubbard route, if anyone knows about the lure of the Labrador wild story. But to cut to the chase, uh, I was getting ready to fly in there, and uh, our plane had a bit of an accident on takeoff. And more or less, uh, we had a bit of a, bit of a hard situation there, and the, and the plane kind of had a, a flip over. And anyways, I ended up with a scare. So I came home. And uh, myself, the pilot, and, and Saku were lucky to uh, to get out in, in one piece, all three of us. Uh, and I came back home, and after a few weeks of just uh, resting up, <clears throat> I wanted to continue on with another trip, but I didn't want to go all the way back up to Labrador. It was a bit too much uh, traveling, so I stuck close here to the island and got back out to, to do what I love to do, me and Saku. Next one. Uh, there's one more boosted. It's a shout out from Doug Burton. Uh, love everything you do. Give Saku some love from me. Thank you. Appreciate that. What was his name? Sorry. Doug Burton. Yeah. Appreciate that, Doug. Okay. So uh, 
Where are we to now? Um, I can hmm. answer one. Uh, do you find it hard to edit your videos? Do I find it hard to edit the videos? And who's this question from? This is from Retired and Reselling. Okay. Uh, do I find it hard editing the videos? No, not no. I enjoy editing the videos, and I always say the best thing about it, other than being able to, you know, honestly share with you guys and share my experiences because I love doing that, and you know, I love uh, letting people into my into my lens, into my eyes, and and seeing the great experiences. But uh, it's it's a great way for me to relive the trip. And there's days when I'm down here and I could be laughing to myself and. I'm right tickled. I'm that excited. And Heather's up there being like, what, what's that so funny, you know? But it just could be me watching the trip and watching some of the footage and having good memories. So for me, I really enjoy that. With regards to the, the technical aspect of it, something I just self-taught myself, you know, about, uh, oh, I don't know, say about half, six or seven years ago. So, and I'm always learning. Every time I make a new series, I learn uh, new techniques, new editing techniques and uh, of course, new new ways to shoot my camera when I'm out in the woods. Uh, so yeah, it's uh, certainly it's like anything else. Now it's a it's a lot easier to go out and do the trips and uh, and roam around uh, sometimes. But uh, I do get excited to edit and come home and do that. And uh, it's exciting to to start off with just a bunch of footage. You know, it could be I think for from this most recent trip, I had around forty about 46 hours of footage roughly and to condense that down into six hours and make a nice flowing uh, mm -hmm. series or show or whatever you want to call it and uh, especially get it aired there with with bell uh, on the tv side of it it's uh it was wonderful so uh, i just pick away at it and i'm always learning every time i edit uh, a new video uh we have one from carleen webb um, will you be doing another adventure soon? Yeah, the adventures never end, uh, Caroline, is it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, the adventures never end, of course. Uh, I have all kinds of future plans. Uh, next year, I'm looking to, to, to go off on a, on a very big trip that just trying to fine tune some details uh, for, for 2022. So, and uh, you guys will know soon enough about, about that one once I kind of get some things nailed down, but I'm uh, going off now in, uh, in a week and a half or so to do a trip on the great Northern Peninsula here in Newfoundland, uh, a backpacking trip, me, just me and Saku through uh, the Long Range Mountains. So very wild territory. Uh, some of the, you know, the, the last great wilderness here in Newfoundland up there, pretty much trackless, so big moose territory, caribou, of course, bears, and uh, should be some good fishing uh, as well, crossing over some salmon rivers. So uh, it's going to be exciting, but that's uh, that's coming up now in, uh, in a week and a half. And, of course, I'll, I'll be filming that trip, and that will make its its way out to, uh, to the world sooner than later. We... Uh, we have one from Joshua J. How do you plan your food you take with you and how much at each resupply? Uh, for planning the food, I just try to have uh, roughly somewhere around, f depends on the trip, I guess. With backpacking trips, it's, it's harder to carry a lot of weight so I, I may take a little less food and re rely more on getting some fish maybe backpacking i try to take uh you know three thousand calories per day uh, on that trip last year canoeing uh, i had upwards to 3500 calories a day uh, and i try to typically that gives me about one and a half to two pounds of food per day and that's a good rule of thumb i uh, of course have a high concentration of fat because that's bringing you more calories per gram. But I, I have to balance it. I, you need to have protein in there too to repair your muscles and, of course, carbs for that good quick energy. So I balance it out the best I can. And uh, But, you know, one and a half to two pounds per day is a good rule of thumb in the summertime. Maybe in the winter you can you push it up to two and a half pounds. 
again, and this all depends on how long the trip's going to be. If I'm going out there for 52 days straight like I did last year, I think I may have been under the two-pound mark because I was trying to limit the weight I was carrying. I mean, it's hard to carry 52 days. That was an unsupported trip. I didn't meet no one to get any food along the way. So, uh, of course, I relied a bit on, uh, on lots of the trout we caught. Uh, I take a big liter of olive oil as well. Uh, you know, that's, that's very calorie dense. Uh, but when it, when it came down to it, of course, you can probably see if you went and watched uh, one of the first frames from episode one of that recent series, just like you'd probably do for the Labrador series and the Newfoundland series. Watch the first couple of scenes, and then you go look at me at the end of the trip, and uh, I'm, I, I drop, I lose weight. I lose a fair bit. I think the summer on the 52-day trip, I lost about 20 pounds. So it's hard when you're going out for a long time. But the shorter the trip, the easier it is to bring along the calories you need. Okay, what, what was another? Um, was that all that question? Yeah. Uh, we have one from John Fung. Does it help you feel connected when you are out there, when you talk to the camera, knowing you will share it with, a, with all of us? Does it help me feel connected? Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, for sure. Uh, yeah, I feel connected to you guys, to the viewers, definitely. Certainly when I started do, filming this stuff uh, back in 20... I really broke the GoPro out back in like 2013 or 2014, and I wasn't really sharing sure nothing then. I think I ended up putting some of that stuff on my Patreon there. But uh, I had some early messing around with it, and... Back then, I remember doing it and being like, geez, I'm just out talking to myself out in the woods. And I still, I'm still, i still out talking to myself. I'm talking to Sacco and the trees and everyone else. But uh, so it was a bit different. Now when I'm out doing it and I know there's going to be, uh, you know, a few people watching, and I can connect more to the viewers and know that I'm going to be speaking to you folks. And and uh, I guess, yeah, that really does uh, help foster that connection for sure. Good question. Um. This is from Nicholas Blake. Loved the series. Watched it with my wife and five-year-old daughter. Keep up all the great work. Have you ever considered offering in-person bushcraft courses? Sex having a nap. Excuse me. I'm burped there. Uh, did I ever consider offering bushcraft courses? Or... In-person bushcraft courses. Yeah, outdoor courses, wilderness uh, living courses whatever you want to call it. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah, I will. I will, I will certainly offer courses like that down the road. That's a part of my long-term plan, but the, you know, that is, it's like a whole new project and that will take up, uh, you know, a nice chunk of time if I want to do it right. And right now, uh, the biggest thing on my mind is, is doing these big, these expeditions and getting out and, you know, challenging myself and seeing, some of the great uh, nature we have here on this planet. So down the road, you know, maybe later on in my life, I don't know, say six or seven years time, once I slow down a little bit and uh, I don't know if I'll ever get this thirst for adventure out of my system, but certainly some of the longer trips, if I get those out of my system, my plan is to, is to share my knowledge and do some courses uh, on how to go on expeditions, how to, how to go out for a week. How to go out for two weeks. So I thought about how to do a 30 day trip because that's a good, that's a good sweet spot where I feel like anyone could do a, a, a 30 day trip. You know, you, uh, of course you maybe have to save up your holidays and, uh, and, and, you know, let your boss know a couple of years before, but I think it's, it's, it's doable to get out and have that immersed kind of a long-term experience for, you know, three or four weeks. But I, uh, I'd certainly like to, to do courses on that and uh, ensure that over to, over time. Thanks. Um, good question. From Chris Hillier. What's the biggest brookie you hooked on the trip? Chris, I know Chris, uh, Chris, the biggest brookie, you I mean, you know, there were some big ones. I'd say in between the two and three pound range. I, didn't, I don't think I got anything over three pounds. But uh, some in that range, I don't take a, a scale with me, so it's kind of hard. I, I can I can guesstimate and, and say, oh, this one's two and a half or two pounds, but that's just a guess. Uh, so some some big some big you know thick brook trout or mud trout, what we call them here in Newfoundland. Often, I got a, I got some dandies in there. So hope you're hooking a few too, Chris. 
Um, this was one from Co-Create Happy. BC Hunting Guide Steve of How to Hunt YouTube shares Sasquatch experience with over 65 million views. Have you ever had any high strangeness? No, no. I don't know about Sasquatch, to be honest with you. I'm not going to de debunk it here, but... Uh, I don't know. It, it, to be honest, it seems far-fetched to me. And <laughs> we'll leave it at that. But uh, who knows? I might see one next week, and then... I'll be proved wrong, but nothing, nothing so far. Only the only the animals we know of. Okay. The, the Newfie Outdoors man gave you a shout out and said cheers. Newfie Outdoors man, wicked buddy. Good to hear from you. Appreciate it. Um, so this is from the Ralphies. Just curious. Are these still boosted questions? No. Okay, uh, there's some at the top that I'm still I missed. Okay. I'm seeing now. Uh, you want to hold? Are you just picking random ones? No, I'm going to the top of my screen. Okay, on my screen, I see one from Peter Bosco up at the top there. Okay. Any plans to return to Cania Pisco Reservoir? And I was told that that's pronounced Ganiatskow. So I'm going to say Ganiatskow Reservoir. Someone wrote me and told me that, which is I always like to be pronouncing these uh, these lakes with the proper uh, you know indigenous names, but. I do have plans to go. I don't have plans, to be honest with you, to uh, to go back there. The canoe has been removed. I'll leave it at that. The canoe is no longer there. But I do want to go back and uh, and and start a trip from that point for sure. It's just the way things went. Uh, my I actually planned to do it last year, uh, last summer. But, of course, COVID-19 and all the restrictions prevented me from tra traveling to Nunavik, which is northern Quebec, uh, due to all the indigenous, indigenous communities. And I would have had to have to finish an indigenous community and put those people at risk. So I, I, I couldn't go back and finish it last year. So that's why I then, I then changed last minute, uh, about a week before, to go to Labrador. And then I had the incident up there with the plane. And then third time was a charm, and I got to go do a trip here on the island. So, uh, but definitely gonna get back sometime in my life and, and, and leave from there. And, uh, I don't, cause I don't like having unfinished business. There's a boosted one. Yeah. Um, Chris Volk, will you be taking a trip with Joe Robinette? Chris, Chris who? Volk. B -O -K. Oh, okay. Chris, uh, taking a trip with Joe. Ah, uh, no, nuts, not, no, we got no trips planned, but I've spoke to Joe a few times. Joe's a great fella. And, you know, uh, I'm sure we get along just fine out in the woods. He loves it as much as I do. I think we're just both passionate nature people, and uh, that's where it starts, and that's where it will end. And, uh, you know, you never know. You never know where the wind will take us. Okay. Uh, one from the Ralphies. Just curious, how do you react if a lynx ever approached you in the woods? If a lynx ever approached me in the woods, I don't know if a lynx would approach you. I think you'd pat, you'd cross pass, you, you'd walk by a lynx, and and because they a lot of times they're up in the trees. Uh, I've been told I've never seen one in a tree, but I've read about it. So you probably walk by, or maybe it's sitting in the bushes there, and you'd never know it was there. They're very secretive, and they I don't think uh, they would. You know, uh, I'm not going to say I wouldn't have a head-on-head -head encounter with them because. That could happen, and if that was the case, I'd certainly just kind of stand my ground, be respectful, and, you know, watch every move that Lynx would make. Uh, one, you don't want Lynx to corner you because that's when you can get in trouble. One from Kim L. Were you able to bring the caribou antlers you found home from the trip? No. The, the caribou antlers that I found in the most recent trip on that island – I wanted to bring them home, and that's why uh, you, you see them out there laying on the canoe and uh, on the way back later on the trip. Uh, the, the antlers were still there, of course. No one came in and took them because <laughs> there was probably no one in there. Uh, but I wanted to, but just the thought of uh, having to continue on the Beta Nord River and knowing there was potential portages, mm -hmm. uh, you know, at that point I was, you know, seven weeks almost into a long trip and the last thing i wanted to be doing was carrying around a big rack of caribou antlers though uh they would have been pretty sweet to bring home because they were in good shape 
Uh, Darren Kirkwood, does Saku lose weight over the trip? Well, it looks like we're at 45 minutes. Uh, does Saku lose weight over the trip? Uh, he loses a few pounds, but not like me. I mean, dogs are especially uh, a good working dog like Saku, Cape Shore Water Dog. I mean, his breed, it was designed, bred to be a working dog, you know. They're tough, they're hardy, and he doesn't seem, he may lose a few pounds, but it's not noticeable like it is on me. Okay, we're at 40 minutes now, but we'll go, we'll, we got a, we got a few minutes to go on. We'll go for a little bit longer because there's some good questions, and I want to do my best to kind of support everyone here. It's, you guys have all supported me. It's my timer going off. Uh, this is the least I can do. Okay, let's reset that for another few minutes. <clears throat> okay. Go ahead. Uh, Desiree... Jackson, what spray or tape do you use to repair tents as well as your canoe? Are they basically universal? What spray and tape do I use to repair my canoe? And your tent. Uh, I haven't uh, – I don't spray my, my tents other than – I was given some waterproofing seal there with my last MSR tent, and I used a bit of it, but I don't typically do that to the tents. Maybe I should. Uh, with regards to the canoe, uh, I just have uh, like some uh, some duct tape with me, and I had some marine goop along there on the last trip, uh, which which held up okay, but on a little issue I had there. I just don't think I, I gave it enough time to dry and it was a bit of a damp night uh, after I had done it. But I could uh, I could certainly improve my canoe patching kit if I go on another when I go on another long canoe trip, depending on what type of canoe I have, you know, there's always things to improve on. Okay, I, are you getting uh, are these boosted ones or are you just okay I'm gonna go to the top again. I see some that Heather isn't seeing. Uh, Rob, the Matrix guy, says hi from Nova Scotia. Perfect across the the Gulf of St. Lawrence, sir. Uh, what was the first thing you did when you got home from this past trip? Well, you know, I like to have a cold beer. Certainly had a cold beer and enjoyed some pizza. And uh, got Heather to pressure wash me. But that's that <laughs> got a good rinse for sure. And then I slept for a couple of days straight. Lots of good sleep and, and eating. Sleeping and eating for about 48 hours until I came back to life. Uh, the Big Wing, uh, do you have any Irish in your family? I, my, mother's, uh, my mother's mother was a butler, and I, I believe that's an Irish surname there. But long story short, in Newfoundland, the Irish, uh, the English, Portuguese, people from uh, France, uh, the, a lot of these different groups, Europeans, settled in Newfoundland. That's how we had uh, we became the island Newfoundland and how the population grew here and people settled. Uh, you know, there was indigenous people here before us, the Biafic and, and whatnot, but that's another story. Uh, but, but more or less, these, these different groups settled. So a lot of people in Newfoundland have a mixed dialect with the with some British, you know, some English in there and some Irish and some Portuguese or whatever it might be. I mean, I'm just I'm a mine is very subtle. There's some people in certain parts of Newfoundland. Uh, you'd think they came right from Dublin somewhere, you know, right straight from Ireland. No difference. So there's a bit of that in in, in a lot of us here in Newfoundland. I'm only mine's only minor. Uh, Greg Butler, have you ever been to Rodney Pond? <clears throat> uh, these are right at the top. No, I've never been to Rodney Pond, but I think it's just south again or there, is it not? Heard there's good fish there. Montreal dude, would you take personal contracts for hiking with tourists? Uh, yeah, down the road, I'd, I'd take people out for a hike for sure, but uh, it won't be next week. But if, if it does, I look forward to it. I'd, cer I'd certainly, uh, again, once uh, some of the, you know, the documenting and the big expeditions are behind me and I've, I've built up a good, uh, a good bank of experience, I'm all for bringing people out on tours and, uh, and doing some courses, as I mentioned earlier. 
Matt Shafter, you would love sea kayaking the inside passage from BC up to Alaska. That sounds excellent. Uh, uh, slasher, what's your favorite piece of gear? Whew. That's a tough one. I don't know. You know what I like? I like an axe. I'm a big, I love my axe. You know, I love having an axe with me. And I know a lot of people uh, who are, who are kind of, who go out and, and trip. Some people say, you know, an axe is a dangerous tool. And it is. And I'll be the first one to say, probably the most dangerous tool you have with you when you're out there. But I've used one my entire life. I was swinging an axe when I was probably, you know, five or six years old. So I've gotten used to handling one and I've, I feel very confident with one in my hand, and I I love using my axe when I'm out there, and I always take it with me. Even uh, when I'm going to go on this backpacking trip next week uh, through the mountains, I need to go very lightweight, as lightweight as possible. All I'm taking is a little tiny hatchet versus taking a folding saw or something because I won't need to cut too much wood. A lot of times in the summer you can crack up some sticks just enough to make a small fire, and, uh, you know, things with saws is, you know what, if your blade breaks, you got to have an extra blade with you then, you know, or something along that lines. With the axe, I have a little file on my multi-tool, so I can use that file to sharpen the axe. Uh, I don't need to worry about the blade breaking. Uh, it's a very versa versatile tool as well. I can use it uh, if I happen to lose my multi-tool, a little knife I have. I can use it to, to gut, you know, clean fish or animals and... Uh, to build shelter, so many uses for the axe. Uh, so, cutting up food, whatever. Whereas a saw is not so, not so versatile. Though it's it's still a good option. Uh, my my opinion is if if you're uh, if if you like an axe like I do, take the axe along with you and just be careful. It's you know it's one of those things when you're using it, you got to be conscious of every swing that you make. Uh, so I'll just keep going with some of these. I see that Heather seems to be missing. Because uh, they're just not showing up. A lot of questions came in, so it's hard to keep on top of all of them here. Uh, someone says, video say so. In a survival situation, is it better to keep moving or dig into one place? Not like if you got lost or anything, but if, if that whole civil collapse thing happened, dig in or migrate? uh yeah i don't know that that's a tough one to to answer there i'm about expeditions and, and moving moving uh so if i run out of food i just keep moving to the end as best as i can and hopefully to catch some animals and fish along the way hey justin i'm this is from strange land i'm in whitburn are you from the south shore fairyland no i'm from Baleen. I grew up in Baleen uh, on the north northeast Avalon Peninsula. That's where my mother's from. Look, Dad said, Wade's there, my father. Say hi to Mom, Dad, Joanne. Hi, guys. Hope you're going to join us. God love you. <laughs> uh, <laughs> that was funny. Hello from Wisconsin. Uh, Darren Kirkwood, what's next on the TV front? I'm going to make a little announcement about this in a couple of days, but more or less there's a season two uh, coming to Bell 5 TV in the fall, and that should also make its way to YouTube eventually. But it's coming to, uh, to Bell 5 TV, and it's going to be another six-part series on a winter, two separate winter expeditions. I went out with 33 days with both Saku and Beer in 2020 uh, here in Newfoundland. And then this past winter, 2021, I went for a month up in Labrador on the Eagle Plateau with just me and Beer. So I'm going to combine two of those trips, 62 days or whatever it is, into a six-part series. So that will be coming, coming out uh, later on this year. So I'm excited about that and, of course, excited to share it. So uh, I'm going to skip along. Some questions I've already answered there. You want to go ahead there, Heather? Sure. And uh, one from Henry. Hello. Do you carry a full-size axe, a hatchet, and a camp saw? 
No, 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 no. I wouldn't carry two axes with me, that's for sure. The most, I mean, in the winter time, I have a, a, a bigger medium size axe. I've used uh, the Grand Furs Brooks uh, Small Forest Axe. Uh, more recently, I've been using the uh, Fisters medium size splitting axe. I like that one because it's got a hollow handle. It's a bit lighter, and it's just uh, it's it's fairly good price. You know, about sixty dollars Canadian, and it takes a beating. And if if I lost the axe, well, it's no problem to go out and get another one. Whereas the, the, some of these Grand First Brooks axes, they're you know up, upwards to one hundred and fifty Canadian, for example. And I can get two Fiskers for the price of that. So, uh, but in the winter, I usually have a, a medium size axe and a bow saw. So, uh, you know, the collapsible Bosa, I think I have the Agawa Canyon 21 inch, uh, and then I have uh, another one made by Four Dog Stoves. That one's 24 inches. So I use a Bosa on an axe. And in the summer, I typically, if I'm going backpacking again, I usually just take one thing, one cutting tool, and it's been a small hatchet. When I did the Gray River trip for 17 or 18 days back in 2019, I just took the small hatchet. On a canoeing trip, I, uh, I've only taken, again, uh, a small to medium size axe on the Beta Nord, this most recent 52 day trip, I had a medium size axe and I had that little, uh, back old Laplander folding saw because I don't think there's a need to take a big bow saw in the summer. If I'm going out for a long time and trying to manage the, you know, the weight I carry the best I can. I think a little tiny folding sign and axe is, is good enough. You don't need too much firewood in the summer, especially in, when it's warm out most of the time. You don't need these little tiny fires to enough to get a little bit of heat and cook on, you know. So that's that's good there. Okay. Are you planning on fixing the canoe or buying a new one? Any particular make or model that you're currently looking at? Uh yeah, that canoe is, it's still good to go. It's, there's nothing but to, to maybe fix up that hole there and probably put a couple keel plates on the front and back, which is, I hadn't, where this trip kind of happened quick there in the summer, uh, I didn't uh, bother to go putting any keel plates on, which are basically protective strips at the, the bow and the stern of the canoe. I had thought about it, but I said, you know what? It's a, it's a, that was a strong canoe, the Old Town Guide, and uh, had been through a lot with me. It's a 10-year-old canoe. So I just kind of went out and, and put it through the paces, and it, I got a small hole, but whatever. We got out of the woods, and that's all that mattered. But uh, I'll certainly fix it up, and that'll be good to go for a trip someday. And, uh, of course, I have the uh, Esquif canoe there, which I use for crossing Labrador, and I'm looking now uh, for a trip. I'd like to do uh, a longer trip uh, in 2022. I mentioned it earlier. I'm looking at getting a folding canoe uh, called uh, either either a pack pack boat, pack canoe, or an alley canoe. They're the two foldable canoes on the market. And I'm looking at getting one or the other because this trip will be uh, flying into a remote location. And it's a lot more expensive to get a hard shell canoe strapped to a to a, a float plane, whereas if you have a, a folding canoe, uh, you can pack it up and in, uh, into a small little dry bag and throw it in the plane with you, and it saves on uh, expenses. And they're durable too. People have used them on long trips, and, and they hold up. I think all you need is a little bit of duct tape and some extra material to patch them up. Okay, we're gonna. Couple more minutes now, and I'm gonna pack it in. I think I got two minutes left, so a couple more questions, Heather. Okay, I'll do. Um, Gotta go eat supper then. <laughs> it's impressive how you're able to extend the life of your canoe. Is there anything more you could do before a trip to prevent any damage? Yeah, I guess I just hit on that. Uh, certainly, adding some keel plates to your canoe uh, will prolong the areas that take the most damage, which would be the. Certainly the uh, the bow of the canoe takes the biggest beating, but putting a keel plate on the on the bow and stern. So like my Esquif canoe going across Labrador had keel plates and, you know, by the end of the trip, uh, the front one on the stern was, was pretty much beat off it from dragging it up the river and everything else. Does Heather River trek with you? No. 
Heather does. Uh, we paddled some some rivers, uh, no big rapids or nothing, but we paddled the Exploits River and Great Rattling Brook here in Newfoundland over the last month in the rafts because we have a. I still have my alpaca raft, the one I use crossing Newfoundland, and Heather has one now made by Coca Pelli. So we both went out and did a bit of river paddling, and you know, nice and at a good slow, relaxing pace, and had a couple of cold Pepsis in there. It was all good. What was the story of the boat plane in this adventure? Did he just spot you out of the blue? Okay, yeah. My uh, my buddy of mine there, Gene Plowman, who flew in there, I think it was episode four. Uh, he works, he's with Thorburn Aviation here, uh, uh, a bush plane company in Newfoundland. But I had spoke to him uh, before the trip uh, and because he flies around that area quite often, the Bay to North Wilderness area. <clears throat> it's uh, one of his favorite spots to just kind of go up and go for a spin. And he had a, a camp on the outskirts of that area. So I had talked to him and he said he may be around and I had him in my little satellite device. And one day he touched base with me and told me he'd be flying in there. Uh, so I gave him my coordinates and uh, he told me uh, any day he'd be, he'd be dropping down. So when I had set up camp, at that area for uh it was about a week or so me and saku there were we were at that same sort of campsite once we climbed up the river and got into the heart of the reserve so he told me in that time frame he was going to pop in and he kind of showed up for the visit so i knew he he might be in at some point in time and it was great to see him and he gave me a couple cold beer first beer in over a month uh he was actually the first person we had seen in uh, in 30 30 days there so not another soul until gene came in uh, so and, and refilled coffee because coffee is important i get pretty cranky if i ran out of coffee out there and i was getting low so uh, he showed up with a bit of that which was great so if gene you're watching really appreciate that again if you want you can end on a yeah. shout out yeah um so That's from fun. jonathan ball he said really enjoyed the series dressed in great work Thanks, Jonathan. And we'll do one more question, Heather, before I pack it in. Pick one more out there, no? Okay. Um, have you ever experienced hypothermia? Have I experienced have I ever experienced hypothermia? No, I've I've never actually been hypothermic, though I I certainly believe I was on the fringes of it. There's a episode on uh, there's a series there called uh, A Week Camping in Wild Country bit of a trip there from a few years ago it's on the channel a week camping in wild country and the at the end of that trip i mean i knew uh, i was i was heather was picking me up on the side of the road and i was hiking to get back out to meet her and i did something like uh, 25 kilometers in one day and this was in the spring of the year it got very cold it was a very cold damp day and it rained it even snowed a bit in april uh, so i just kept trekking and even with my rain gear on, eventually you just kind of get wet. And actually the rain gear I had was, wasn't top, top of the line. Oh, well, not a big deal. But I did get soaked to the bone and I did get cold. And I knew the whole time that I could stop and get in the bushes and whittle out some dry wood and start a fire. But the fact that I knew she was coming, I just kept pushing, pushing on just to test my limits too and see what, uh, what I could handle. And, uh, but I got back home and uh, I could feel like my body temperature dropped and I got in the vehicle and I was kind of shaking and stuff uh, on the way home. But uh, certainly uh, I pushed the limits there, but I've never truly been hypothermic. Up in Labrador on that 83-day trip towards the end when it got a lot colder than I had expected for, you know, end of September, uh, my feet were cold to the, to the point. Uh, just this is because I was sitting in the canoe say eight to 10 hours a day stationary and uh my feet were getting cold with with uh you know only hiking boots on sometimes they were a bit wet and i had a dry suit on as well but even if even with that my feet were getting cold and i had some pins and needles and stuff on my feet when i got home and i think there was uh my doctor said just the onset of uh of some frost nip there which is early signs of frost bite so i had some situations in the cold but you know, fire is my friend out there, and I I, uh, I feel uh, very capable of making a fire in any situation. So that gives me uh, peace of mind and uh, keeping certainly keeping dry clothes at all times uh, in your pack. 
you know, get some good wool gear and wool socks in a good dry bag. That's important. And uh, I hope, I hope if I keep doing that, I, I won't find myself in any hypothermic situation. So, but that can creep up on you and you may not even know you're getting it. So keep yourself warm, try to keep your clothing dry the best you, you can and uh, make sure you're, you keep practicing with fires. And if you're going out, uh, it's important that you're, you can make those in, in any situation, rain or shine, snow, whatever. So that's it. Now I'm gonna have to pack it in. Was there a last? Just two little shout outs. Okay, okay, there are shout outs there. Go ahead. Um, one from Millpert. Itchalot? Millpert? Yeah. Millpert. Okay, Millpert. Um, keep shout up out there. the great work. And, Thank you. And then one from Mr. You Dustin Tube. Uh, buy yourself a cold one. You have made my day many times. Thanks. Who's that one from Dustin? Uh, you, Mr. You Dustin Tube. Sorry, guys, I'm trying my best. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Thanks, uh, Dustin Tube. I'll have a cold one as soon as I get off this now. And Jonathan Ball put one in there too. Really enjoyed the series. Thanks, Jonathan. All right, guys. Uh, you know, I did my best to answer as many as I could, and I could be here for hours, but unfortunately, time is precious, and I got to go and get some supper on the go and move on to other things. So I'll try uh, to do another one of these when I come back from my next trek there later in the summer. Thanks again for watching this series, watching all the videos, supporting any way you can. Uh, I wish you the best this summer. Stay safe out on your adventures. Be patient. Look after yourselves. And uh, most importantly, have fun. So take care. And uh, thanks to Heather as well for making this a little easier for me. And say goodbye to Sack. Sack, what's up? He's chilling out. Okay, take care.